I'm Lynn Broaddus and I'm your moderator for today and the session is uh, Agents of Change, Communities Collaborating to Solve Complex Problems. So hopefully that's where you want to be. Um, I was asked to introduce myself just a little bit. I am, uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I was in Wisconsin for a long time and am uh, an emeritus member of the Board of Visitors here at Nelson, past president of that board. And uh, my, my um, past experience in Wisconsin included uh, running Milwaukee Riverkeeper for many years, uh, founding the Milwaukee Environmental Consortium, and uh, leading the environment program at the Johnson Foundation at Wingspread for many years. Um, also been involved with and on the boards of the River Alliance of Wisconsin and Wisconsin Legal Conservation Voters. So I feel very much at home here. I'm not a native Wisconsin. I, but I um, uh, spent uh, some pretty special time here, and I'm not too far away now. My, um, I now have my own company, Broadview Collaborative, where I consult on collaborative problem solving, especially with regard to water, and especially where that intersects with uh, uh, broad scale uh, policy and, um, and changes and strategy, and especially around uh, sustainable practices for water utilities. Um, so, but anyways, it's my, my pleasure to be here. And uh, those Pazito specialties have nothing to do with what our panelists are going, not nothing directly to do with what our panelists are going to be sharing with us today. So, um, uh, a lot of environmental problems are really difficult and really thorny. You know, there's a saying, I get it wrong, but it's something like, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to, um, uh, I forget what the pithy thing is, but if you want to get to a really strong solution, you go slow and you go together. And I think those are the those are the kind of stories that we are going to be hearing about today. Um, and uh, uh, so each of these, each of our panelists has uh, will share with us a story about community collaborative problem solving and, and ways that they went about doing it. I'm going to introduce all four of our panelists before starting to hand it over to them, and they each have about 10 minutes to share with us uh, some highlights from their story or a particular aspect of the story from their community, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A and, and conversation. So let me start here with Paul. Paul Domain, also known by his Ojibwe name of Skabewis, or the messenger. Paul is a citizen of the United Nation in Wisconsin and is of Ojibwe descent, currently residing on um, the La Cour uh, Chippewa Reservation near Hayward, Wisconsin. Domain is a member of the Bear Clan. He is CEO of Indian Country Communications Incorporated, editor of the national native newspaper News from Indian Country, of which there are some copies in the back, a video producer for IndianCountryTV.com, and the special projects coordinator for the Great Lakes for the Intertribal Agricultural Council. Domain also is co-chair of the Pipeline Fighting Activist Organization, Honor the Earth, which is headed by Harvard-educated uh, economist Winona LaDuke. So welcome, Paul. We're, we're glad to have you here. Uh, sitting next to him is Greg Armstrong. And Greg is director of land management and environmental education at Holy Wisdom Monastery after serving on the board as a volunteer for eight years. Previously, Greg was the director of the UW-Madison Arboretum. Greg grew up in Cooksville, a small village among the cow pastures of southern Wisconsin, where he learned to care about plants and nature while exploring local streams, wetlands, and woodlands. He studied horticulture and botany at UW-Madison. Desiring a more specialized education, he attended the student program at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew uh, in England at, uh, for three years and received the Kew Diploma. And if you, I don't know if any of you have ever had the pleasure of visiting those gardens, but it's a pretty special place, so I presume it's a pretty special education. Next to Greg is Marcy West. Marcy is the executive director for the Kickapoo Valley Reserve in southwestern Wisconsin. As director since 1996, Marcy has not just witnessed the transfer, transition of this property that was previously destined to become a human-made lake. Uh, she's witnessed and really been a key part of helping it become a publicly protected 8,600-acre reserve that attracts low-impact recreation enthusiasts year-round. She's currently writing a book about that process and the, um, the place. 
and uh, is writing that book in cooperation with UW Nelson. And then at the end of our row here, we have Alandria Williams, who is the director of training at People's Hub, and just recently in off the plane from Barcelona. So um, <laughs> if she falls asleep, don't hold it against her. <laughs> she also provides development support to cooperatives, mostly in the southern United States, and is co-editor of Beautiful Solutions a project that is gathering some of the most promising and contagious stories, solutions, strategies, and big questions for building a more just, democratic, and resilient world. Beautiful Solutions has a web platform, trainings, and a book soon to be released. For the last 11 years, Alandria worked at the Highlander Research and Education Center, first as a youth and intergenerational programs director, and then helping to coordinate economics and governance programs, such as Mapping Our Futures curriculum, and the Southern Grassroots Economies Project. So well, it's quite a, a breadth of experiences and I'm sure stories that we will hear. I'm going to ask Marcy to start us off and then we'll do Marcy, Paul, Greg, and Alandria. Thanks for coming. Uh, one of my favorite conferences of the year and this is such an honor to be on a panel with these distinguished guests. Um, so what our complex problem was, was a, a dam in the Kickapoo Valley Kickapoo River was proposed um, way back in the 1930s. And uh, the mission was to control the flooding. So that was uh, what the proposal was. The Corps of Engineers uh, at the time, at the bequest of the politicians, uh, purchased 149 family farms, businesses, removed schools, uh, a full 8,600 acres cleared. The um, partially completed dam ran into problems because of the environmental movement as well as budget overruns. Um, the environmental movement of the early 70s, as everyone knows, uh, brought about the changes that required an environmental impact statement, protection for archaeological sites, things like that. So uh, if we fast forward, the, the project was halted in 1975 due to those cost overruns and the, um, the environmental concerns and a study by the UW that showed that the lake and dam would probably be a very sediment laden lake, that it wouldn't promise the recreation that was shown. Um, and that 8,600 acres sat idle basically until 1993. Um, it was no man's land. The Corps of Engineers had um, basically management from La Crescent, Minnesota. Um, and there were challenges throughout to try and get the dam completed. And those continually failed. So um, the slides are just basically a visual. Um, those have, Anybody been to the Kickapoo? Well, oh wow. <laughs> you guys can tell the story. Come on. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew there were hills in Wisconsin that it's not totally flat. Um, so, this beautiful site lay idle. Um, in 1993, the citizens really took it upon themselves to come up with a solution. And um, they needed a bipartisan solution. And so, anyone in the room that's under 30, I promise you, bipartisan solutions can happen. Um, don't give up hope. At the federal level, it was Republicans and Democrats that came up with the solution that the 8,600 acres, first the project would be deauthorized, the Corps of Engineers would not complete the dam, and then that it would be transferred to the state of Wisconsin and Ho-Chunk Nation for joint management. And the responsibility is equal. The, um, the Ho-Chunk Nation, due to the significant archaeological sites that exist on the property, have members on the board, they have joint management responsibilities, they manage their property as well. So what we have now is an 11-member board of directors, sanctioned by the state of Wisconsin, agreed to by the Ho-Chunk Nation, and it's a local management board that sets the policy for the 8,600 acres. Um, and we work together on a variety of things. Uh, the public recreation is very popular, obviously canoeing, kayaking, camping, things like that. But it's also part of the mission to provide education. The, um, the 8,600 acres is rich in flora, fauna, um, the bird list is in the back. 
things like that. And it's just really important to protect a site like this. Um, the ongoing issues, the, uh, the problems with flooding continue, unfortunately. Um, the original proposal for the dam to protect the downstream citizens, um, what we're seeing in storms now probably wouldn't have worked anyway. The, the storms are so intense and they come in from all sides. So you would basically need a, a dam on every little tributary or, you know, addition to the, to the river. Um, but what has happened is that the, the reserve at 8,600 acres, obviously we, hit, we get the flood hits, but there's not houses, there's not highways, there's not those people being impacted within that property and what it absorbs definitely helps. Downstream communities have moved out of the floodplain. Lafarge just finished moving 13 more houses out after the 08 floods. So it's, it's getting out of the way seems to be a bit of a solution for the flooding. Um, and the other thing is that the economy is still strapped in southwest Wisconsin. We are fortunate to have Organic Valley headquarters located nearby in both Lafarge and uh, Cashton, and that's a big employer. And then, of course, the attraction, the beauty of the place for people to come and visit. Um, so we're, we're um, moving along. The board of directors has gone through a very painful process. Finances are always of concern. But it is, as far as how bad it was with the Corps of Engineers and a, a failed dam project, it has gotten much better. And um, so we look forward to the future of having this place permanently protected and a local management solution um, for a property like this. So I look forward to the discussion, but we need to move it along. Oh, well, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, brought me uh, uh, back some memories because I've been down. It's, it's so nice to know that so many people have been over to the Kickapoo Valley project and looked at it because, again, that uh, to me is such a historically significant, geologically significant, and just a plain, beautiful area. But right away when someone said, uh, uh, when, when Marcy says one of the, the resolutions to the problem is, is moving people out of the valley, it reminded me right away of uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, fight at Standing Rock because uh, Lake Oahe that flooded uh, uh, several thousand acres of land along the Rosebud and the Standing Rock, excuse me, the Standing Rock uh, uh, reservation there was flooded in the 1950s and 60s in order to resolve the problem of downstream flooding as well. And uh, I always scratch my head when someone says, well, you know, we've got to make a lock and dam situation on the Standing Rock Reservation to resolve a problem of downstream flooding on the Missouri and Mississippi rivers because so many people built in the floodplain. That's right. That's right. And you say, why would anyone want to build in a floodplain? Uh, causing uh, all kinds of situations. So when you look at the dynamics of what happened at Standing Rock, you want to remember that grandparents, grandmothers, grandmas stood on the shoreline of the Standing Rock Reservation and watched as their farmlands uh, were flooded, not in the 1880s when the Sioux were uh, relocated and confined to the reservations, but in the 1950s and 60s, they watched the graves, they watched some of the most productive farmlands on those reservations, some of the most productive people who had migrated to those uh, uh, lands uh, flooded in the 1960s. And so when you see anger at the Army Corps of Engineers for rerouting a pipeline uh, north of Bismarck, because people said if, uh, if it would leak, it would have flooded Bismarck's, uh, would have uh, spoiled Bismarck's water, uh, as well, let's just move it south of Bismarck, down by that reservation where all those Indians, you know, uh, you, you know, you know how they are, it's kind of a thing. So anyway, so just a reflection on that. In our community, um, we are faced with uh, numerous uh, challenges. 
I didn't bring any slides today because I thought once I went through the 100 slides that I thought I ought to go up there with pipelines and everything else, it's like it's just overwhelming. The pipeline grid is a huge grid in uh, North America of very, very many different kinds from uh, natural gas to crude oil to tar sands to uh, dilutants going uh, back north. And uh, we bog down uh, very often in, in numbers over lines and everything. But I wanted to start out my short presentation by just reminding people that we start from a point of view of an aboriginal land base, that people were here and that the rights they had within those territories uh, came with them and have been eroded and taken away. There isn't a federal judge that gave a tribal person the right to hunt and fish on the ceded territory, the right to exist somewhere that uh, wasn't reserved. And so we want to talk about the treaties and the powers that shifted off of those aboriginal land bases and communities into treaties of agreements that needed to be sustained, the development of the reservations, and the retention of uh, user fructuary rights, those rights to gather uh, resources off the reservation uh, to hunt and to fish for subsistence rather than sports uh, purposes and uh, issues that arise on a regular basis in northern Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota having to do with the interactions of tribal governments, the federal government, the state government, the counties and towns. And you'll see those conflicts erupt uh, now and then uh, in the news as relationships are strained. But I had a good uh, dis discussion with an elder. I did an interview with uh, from the Bad River Reservation by the name of uh, Joe Rose. He's in his 80s. He ran uh, two years ago for uh, election on the town board because at a mining impact hearing, uh, he raised his hand up and uh, one of the people on the panel there says, well, you know, Mr. Rose, you're not an elected official and you can't uh, speak uh, up here. Uh, because it's only uh, elected officials that are dealing with it today. Well, Joe Rose ran for county uh, office, he got elected, and he got put on uh, that uh, mining impact board, so he was the one sitting there telling other people who couldn't, couldn't talk. <laughs> But, but Joe talked about it because pipelines were just one issue that the tribal community has to dealt, uh, has had to deal with. And, you know, we could go back a long ways or we could just go back for the last quarter of a century. And the interview was about environmental battles at the Bad River Reservation. And I thought Joe had been through them at all. And so he sat down and says, yeah, you could start out with the dumping of uh, the Marathon Corporation, later known as American Can. Uh, who had a big factory in Ashland, Wisconsin, but they dumped all their stuff on the reservation because there was a cheap lease for land out there that later polluted the, the lowest uh, aquifers on the reservation in which several communities now rely on uh, bottled water uh, for their drinking water. And uh, he, he says, and then there was the reserve uh, uh, mining uh, corporation up on the north shore of Lake Superior where they discovered asbestos in to Duluth water systems and all the water systems that were along uh, the Lake Superior Lakeshore, which they had to uh, go into court and to challenge them and get the EPA involved. And he says in the 1990s, there was the acid uh, train protest that stopped uh, the sulfuric acid train coming across tanks on a rickety old uh, uh, bridge. Uh, Joe said he walked out there and there were spikes and he, he, he leaned over and picked the spikes right out of the bridge and he says there was trees growing through the bridge and uh, a group of investors wanted to send acid up to the White Pine uh, mine site and dump it in there and leach out the minerals and members of the Bad River Reservation uh, parked on that railroad tracks and says you're not coming across this bridge. And Joe says it was astounding what people had for ideas to remediate in case there was an accident. If there was an accident on the Bad River and an acid train leaked or something, after the accident, the conductor would get out and there would be a special box that had limestone in it. And the conductor would shovel limestone into the Bad River to help neutralize the acid. Joe Rose said, he says, I thought that was a joke. He says, I started laughing. He says, but that was their remediation plan in case there was an accident on the Bad River. And of course, the Bad River uh, puts out something like 40,000 pounds of wild rice within the Cacogan Sloughs and in the Bad River area. 40,000 pounds at 
$15 a pound or in the cupboard is a lot of um, food to sustain the family or to help sustain the economy. So uh, in addition to the fact that the Kokogan Sloughs is the breeding grounds for numerous other waterfowl and, and, and walleyes, spawning walleyes and, and other uh, food that uh, the Bad River Ojibwe people have always had access to and was a major component of their treaties. When the U.S. government wanted their property ceded to them, the elders there says, how are our great-great-grandchildren, seven generations from now, going to feed themselves? Well, we're going to reserve the right to hunt, fish, and gather medicines and other resources off of those lands in public hands. And uh, that's what was put into the treaty. There was oil drilling in Keystone Township, Bayfield County, uh, in the same area. And uh, people could uh, envision the idea that in the future there might be some in Shaquamigan Bay. They put an end to that project. They put an end to the, uh, to the acid train uh, white pine project. There was neutralysis, an incineration project in, uh, in uh, Ashland. Uh, in which they were going to burn a hundred times more garbage than was brought, being brought into the current landfill, so they knew that they were going to become a desti destination site for everybody's else garbage to be uh, incinerated, and who might be uh, downwind from uh, that incineration. There was the GTAC Mining Company most recently up in the Pinocchio Range, and you want to think about the fact that this was supposed to be one of the world's largest open pit mines, uh, it was proposed to be something like 22 miles long. It kept shrinking as public opposition grew against the mining project. It would be a um, it would be a project in which there were would be uh, sulfide uh, mining waste. There would be slurry slurry ponds. They would be using thousands of gallons of water every single day. And the tribe, the tribal elders, got together and say, no, not for Chris Klein, a billionaire. He doesn't need it anymore. If it was, had to do with World War III, if it had to do with the salvation of the United States, maybe, but not for a, a billionaire. And so, again, the tribe said no to that because all of the water systems flow into the Bad River a watershed and into Lake Superior from there. So I've got one minute left to finish this presentation. <laughs> but we want to remind people that the fears of the Bad River elders was is that there might be a breach of a slurry, and there's been several in the Northwest and South America, out in Arizona recently, and then there was the July 11, 2016 rainstorm in northern Wisconsin, where we had five to seven inches in a couple hours, and it blew out every single major uh, road into northern Wisconsin. In order to go from Bad River and get over to Hurley, Wisconsin, was a two and a half hour drive over to Superior, down to Hayward, across and back up. And then we didn't even get into Line 5, but let's look at this. There's been tribes who are talking about trying to uh, reduce the fossil fuel imprint, trying to protect Cree territory from the tar sands destruction that's going on, or from uh, the Kalamazoo, Michigan type of spills. Line 3 in Minnesota, uh, the tribes up there have endured uh, some 60 spills over the last 75 years from the various lines that run across northern Minnesota. They're fighting Line 3, that they don't want to go through their wild rice beds. Line 3 is contingent to when it gets to Superior, they got to decide whether uh, they need to put a twin line in uh, Wisconsin along the route called uh, 66. They got to decide what to do with Line 5 across the Mackinac Straits and the Bad River Reservation. Uh, and most recently, if you've watched the news, a tugboat with an anchor uh, bra uh, dragged across the line, damaging um, a, uh, uh, some other kind of a line down there and damaging the line. So accidents do happen. Each one of these decisions, each one of these issues that was raised took community assistance. You know, and, and I always say this, if you're going to... Uh, oppose something, make sure that you got coffee and fry bread going 24-7 if you're feeding people. If you can get them to sit down, you've got half of the argument there. But it's bringing the community together, the environmental community, the business community, and those people who are concerned about the future of northern Wisconsin for several generations ahead, not for profit right now. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about some absolutely extraordinary 
women at uh, Holy Wisdom Monastery who have been very bold and courageous in living out their re religious convictions. And among those religious convictions is that they need to care for the earth. Uh, this is a, a Benedictine uh, a community, religious community. Uh, their uh, mission is uh, weaving prayer, hospitality, justice, and care for the earth into a shared way of life. The, this is uh, St. Benedict. Uh, he was born in 480. And one of the principles that uh, might lead one to uh, care for the earth comes from uh, the rule of Benedict, which was kind of the instruction manual that Benedict wrote back in the 500s uh, as uh, how to live a deeply religious life in a monastery. And that principle is universal reverence. Everything in the world is from God, therefore it needs to be revered and cared for. These Benedictine sisters that came to the Madison Diocese back in the 1950s had come from uh, Sioux City, Iowa. And their purpose was to set up a, a residential high school for girls, a Roman Catholic uh, residential high school, and they looked at several parcels of land in the Madison, Dane County area, and eventually came to the one that they ultimately purchased, which is where the monastery is located now. They went to the top of the hill, saw this magnificent view of uh, Lake Mendota, and the land that they came into uh, had been agricultural land for about 120 years, uh, uh, this uh, is the uh, government surveyor's map from 1832, and they're down next to Fourth Lake in one of the bottom row, and there was a, a major uh, Indian trail that uh, led through the property, and uh, there's still some physical evidence of that trail that led from the Four Lakes up to Lake uh, Winnebago. And the other thing that the surveyor found, and the native people uh, knew about, uh, was that it was covered with uh, prairie. Uh, there was uh, open grassland prairie, but more commonly, uh, savanna. But it wasn't very long uh, after the government sold that land for cheap to uh, uh, Euro types that came from the east uh, that they plowed it up to turn it into farms. So all of that time up until the sisters came uh, from uh, the 18, 1836 when the land was first sold to the time that they came to settle there, uh, uh, it was under the plow. Uh, this is the uh, mother house and uh, convent, which was built in uh, 1954. It had uh, rooms for the sisters to live in, and prayer space, uh, food service, all of the things they needed to leave. And then uh, a couple of years later, they built the school, had a big chapel on it, dorm rooms for the girls and uh, all of the other things that you need for a residential school. Well, the school idea kind of uh, went by the wayside. I think that the enrollments kind of fell off and in the 1960s. And they, uh, another really important thing happened in the Roman Catholic Church, and it was called the Second Vatican Council. It's kind of an opening up of the church, and it talked about being ecumenical and being more inclusive, I guess is a, a more modern way to say that. Uh, anyway, well, here's, uh, uh, these are some of the girls at the Academy of St. Benedict. Uh, the uh, nun in the lower right is uh, Sister Mary David Walchenbach, who is the current prioress, and she was much younger. 
I just put this picture in because it's so fantastic. <laughs> uh, they had an equestrian program at their school. Uh, but this was the way that uh, Benedictines over the centuries have uh, cared for the earth uh, in that they did uh, gardening to feed themselves and did agriculture. And these are our sisters and uh, novices with the white uh, headdresses on uh, that are doing uh, gardening on that uh, land where we are now. Well, one of the really bold and courageous things that the sisters did was that in the, uh, the, they decided that this idea of being ecumenical was so important to them, and they also realized that they couldn't live out their religious principles as well as they wanted uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, so they kind of backed the uh, monastery out of the Roman Catholic Church very carefully. <laughs> and uh, in 2006, it became the first ecumenical monastery in the new world. So in religious circles, it was really uh, huge news. Uh, and uh, well, there's their new monastery building. They had uh, care for the earth all along, but in the uh, 1990s, they decided that the way in which they were going to care for the earth mainly was through ecological restoration. So they started out restoring prayers. Uh, anyway, when they built their new monastery building, they wanted it to be really green, and indeed it is. This is a uh, picture that was taken in 1996 with the first sowing of prairie. They now have 126 acres of prairie. 33 of those have been planted within the past three years. The results are quite extraordinary. We're kind of pushing 200 uh, species of uh, uh, native Wisconsin plants uh, that are growing in the prairies. Uh, the sisters also, uh, when they jolly well couldn't afford it, bought uh, a new 53-acre parcel of land, uh, uh, which was uh, in agriculture, which was adjacent, and they wanted it for a long time. They also went through the effort to have a what amounts to a master uh, land management plan developed. And it calls for the restoration of all of the fire communities of southern Wisconsin, Open Prairie, Savannah, and uh, also uh, Closed Canopy uh, Oak Forest. That, on that new parcel of land that they bought in 2012, uh, we had a uh, prairie planting. This picture was taken on November 1st, 2014. We had 98 volunteers and we planted 20 acres of prairie in one day. <laughs> we planted 126 different kinds of seeds and last year we went out and counted over 110 of them growing in this new uh, prairie. I think one of the more important things that we might be doing is having an influence on uh, a new generation that might help us care for the earth in the future. <clears throat> we have just recently, like last winter, taken on a fairly significant, at least by our standards, uh, savanna restoration project. We have a remnant savanna with beautiful white oak and burr oak trees and all these other weedy things had grown up and we had a logging operation. Low impact logging, so we skidded the uh, logs out with, uh, with horses. It was also photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like a druid encampment to me, but uh, <laughs> these are the brush piles that are the result of all the slack. <laughs> we have a long way to go. And here's, uh, you're truly starting out with planting some oaks into the thing. 
I started out with those little seedlings, but the deer ate them off. So, <laughs> and we uh, we burn the prairies, and very soon we're going to be burning the savannas and the woodlands. Uh, we have to work right up, up to that. We have organized a uh, friends organization called the Friends of Wisdom Prairie, and uh, we have environmental education programs. There's a woman talking about. Uh, Hildegard of Bingen, if you want to read about someone who is really extraordinary, <laughs> Hildegard of Bingen, 1100, she was talking about ecology. <laughs> and we have outings to other natural areas, here we are on the West Port Drum, which is almost next door. And here are those extraordinary women, Benedictine women of Madison, at Holy Wisdom Monastery. So, there's some things that are similar and things that are very different. You'll notice really soon. I come from a place, I'm going to a place, I am and I am. I come from a place, I'm going to a place, I am and I am. I come from a peoples, a peoples that are from Florida and Tennessee. A peoples that fought in Seminole Indian Wars and ran away from slavery and started towns all over northern Florida. I come from a people who don't believe in nature is over here, the way we live is over here, police brutality is over here, it's all interconnected because it's happened to all of us. I come from peoples that are from mountains and beaches and family. I come from community. I also just came from Barcelona, Spain. <laughs> and so I'm slightly tired um, because I'm in a global alternatives to development working group. Um, and I'm the North American representative because um, you only really need one um, <laughs> and a global conversation about what we're doing in the world um, and what has to happen, to be real frank. Um, and so I'm going to bring some of that in too because I think it's really necessary. And so my first identity generally is as an organizer. Um, and so I'm the organizer in the crew. Um, and somebody who both believes we have to resist and build all at the same time. Um, and so a couple years ago, I joined Rachel Plattis over here um, and Eli Fagali on a project called Beautiful Solutions. Um, because in our organizing work, we knew what to do to fight, fight, fight. That we're pretty good at, actually. Uh, we might have a slight problem, though, with implementation. Just a slight. Um, and so we would win huge fights. And then we'd be like, mm hmm. <laughs> or we'd be like, okay, now we've got, we know, we've taken over the government. Ooh, governance, right? And so we're like, okay, if we're going to figure out actually what it takes to not just win the win, but to actually change the way our world moves, we have to figure out how do we implement the things we want to put in place? How do we think about what are the solutions that are out there and not just mandrigal, or not just this one thing over here, but having a much more globalized sense around what is possible. And how do we think about, we don't have all the answers and we never will. So we started Beautiful Solutions out of a process to say, how do everyday ordinary people, without the 22 degrees, that didn't go to all the universities, that don't get to travel, get to learn about what is happening when they don't actually have the ability to leave where they come from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, and if I talk too fast, tell me to slow down. Because unlike everybody else where I live, I talk extraordinarily fast. Um, and so I worked at the Highlander Center for 11 years. My family's connected there. Um, it's a movement center, and we work with people all over the world to think about how do we shift the economy we're in, how do we shift governance, how do we shift all the things that are going down. Um, and we have started a governance and economics program that was really about, okay, yes, let's bring in the folks that are both doing, because the economic crash had happened, and people didn't know what had gone down. Like, how did we get here? And so we were like, how do we put together traditional economic justice organizers with traditional climate justice organizers with people who are also doing economic solidarity economy enterprises, alternatives, and commons? To go, if we're going to do work in this place over here, how do we look at all the different ways of moving stuff in our places, right? And not just say we're going to do this one strategy, like that's going to be the only way. Um, but people also had no concept for what to do. Next, they were like, mm -hmm, let's start a bike shop. <laughs> and I was like, but you don't really live in a place where there are any bikes. So, because it's too rural. So let's come up with a new plan. And so we started 
talking to people all over the globe going, what are you doing around manufacturing? What are you doing around housing? What are you doing around environmental restoration? And so, and thinking around, we still have to do reparations and restoration, right? We can't just go, we're gonna just start from scratch because we've got a legacy of foolishness that we also have to address. And we have to look at what does it mean to repair, restore, and reparate. <laughs> because we can't just all act like we're going to all start from here and we're going to all be good. Does that make sense? Okay, great. I hope reparations for all of you is a great concept. Because it's time to do some work. Um, and so really, like, if we're going to have reparations, the common social economy enterprises, and participatory governance, what does that look like? And so there are examples for days, right, around what people are doing. So there's restorative ocean farming in Maine. I've only been to Wisconsin and Minnesota so many times it's really cold, so I can only come in the summertime, really. Um, so I don't get to see some of the beautiful things happening. I will go visit all of your places at some point. Um, it's just very cold, so I'll come back in July. Um, and so the real deal is when we think about what has to shift, because I live in Appalachia, right? So I don't know if people know where Appalachia is, the beautiful mountains, where we have a nice purple bubbly water. Um, and when people think about what solutions are there, let's do four-wheeler parks. And let's make another airfield. Because we don't know where the planes are coming from, but somehow that's a good economic plan. Who knows why? Um, or the huge fight against everything environmental is massive. And I live in a place where people are massively divided. So just the conversation around, what does it mean that you're sitting in a place, and I love coal, is predominant. Right, like this is my way of life and if you're videotaping anything, you're getting shot at. So it isn't just a cute concept, it is like literally war in the midst of what it means to save the mountains and the trees and the way of life that people themselves are having to fight against that they really need. Because they don't want their entire environment destroyed, there's just no work. And so how we have real, honest conversations about where we need to go, recognizing at the base are people who are trying to survive. They're not even at thriving yet, they're still at survival. And so starting from there is a concept. Because once we did that, we were like, okay, how can we actually make some wins? Right, so we stopped a lot of mounts our removal. I mean, unfortunately, like a lot of things we fought for are like leaving every single day, right? Um, so every day there's a new, like Trump administration foolishness, that the thing you fought for, you thought you won three years ago is now not there. Um, and so now we're at a different place around, okay, we've pushed for rural broadband because we don't have broadband in a lot of places where I live. And we won twice to get the money, but it's not here. So instead, how do we do it differently? And so I'm saying some of the things that aren't about the environment because I think when we talk just about the environment, we actually really do narrow down reality because it isn't just about a thing. It's like if our way of life is constructed around our mother, right, and it's constructed around how we live, then how our health is is essential, right? So an example is, um, how much time I got, one minute? Yeah, two minutes. Two, minutes. great. <laughs> so there's a group called Freedom Inc. that's here locally, who I love a lot. And so a couple years ago, we were working with them because people were like, we want to be able to grow medicine, medicinal plants, and we want to be able to grow food and public housing units in Madison. But we can't because HUD has not allowed people to grow food or medicinal plants in housing products. Do people know this? No. I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so we had to then fight. And so I was their technical assistance provider to help fight to organize to grow medicinal plants and food in housing projects. Who you're fighting against is actually HUD in the housing department. But what it's for is health and to think how do we reimagine how we live. Right, so what does it mean to have village life in a city? Right, what does it mean to have reimagined ways of living in a place? And so I'm just saying that because a lot of times we, uh, we look at things as silos and not going what is a holistic understanding. I have so many stories, I'm happy to tell them in ever. But I actually don't think that's what matters because I think they're from Wisconsin and so they should tell you Wisconsin stories. Um, but the other thing I would just say is that for us popular education is crucial. Um, and how we use our experiences as the base and people to learn from each other all over to think how do we transform. Um, and that we don't have to all know the same things, but we have common struggles. And so the last thing I'll just say, um, mm, 
Being in a place where there are people coming from Brazil and the Niger Delta, we had a huge conversation around single-use plastics. <laughs> um, and our use of the cups. And so one of the things that I think is really important for all of us, seriously, is like our consumption and what we need to do to shift because we are destroying the globe, right? Like we are literally actually destroying the globe. I mean, I love my phone, but dear damn. I mean, I think like just this, I'm like, I didn't need this. This was not necessary, right? And so I think for us to really think hard because on the one hand, we live in a sea of contradictions. We want all the things, but at the same time, don't want, do what we need to do to shift. So then I'm sitting here with folks that are like, we have no, I was with, a, so one of my friends is in Cape Town. They're about to shut off all the water. Shutting it all off. And he's like, what is it going to mean to live by the ocean? If you've been to Cape Town, it's on the ocean. And there is no water. Well, where is it going? I was in Palestine, and Israel is stealing the water, so Palestinians cannot have food. I'm with a friend from Syria, who we are bombing them. And so they are trying to grow food in the midst of being bombed every day. People are doing some amazing, amazing resilient practices all over the globe. And but what we hear about is not that. And so I think part of what I think our struggle is is how do we figure out how those connections happen in relationship and stop the pipelines thinking. Because my family's in Florida and Lord knows the oil drilling is really horrible. Um, and what needs to happen? So, yeah. Thanks. Right, we're going to take about 20 minutes for questions. And where there's okay, so the hands are going up. I had a question, but I'll tell you what, let's just go straight to the audience. I have one back here and then I'll take you, okay? Go ahead. And if you would when you ask your question, just as a matter of protocol, if you will stand, say your name, um, maybe what town you're from or state or something like that, and uh, and then ask your question. So I'm the city of Appleton. Paul's question is for you. What is your well, there's there's still legal challenges uh, going on on several fronts, and so um, you know you're talking about the pipeline itself. The the pipeline was in; it flowed oil, and that's all that uh, Kelsey Warren needed. Under federal law, once he got oil through that pipeline one time, he is sustained by oil tariffs at this point. If they close the thing down, he will make all the money back plus 10% of his investment because that's how federal law works, which is part of the reason why there's this anxiety to get in a new infrastructure in a lot of places. Once you get oil through that, our federal governmental laws provide that they'll pick up at least a 10% profit off of that particular pipeline project once they get oil through it once. So there's challenges to the environmental impact statement that are still going on. Uh, everyone's a watchdog. Uh, about 90% of the leaks that are found on pipelines are generally reported by the public who are out and about. So it's being aware of what's going on, knowing where the pipelines are and checking on them. Um, there, where you're going to see a lot of issues is on Line 3 in Minnesota this summer because if Line 3 goes in, it uh, then is dependent on what happens in Wisconsin and Michigan and with Bad River asking Enbridge to remove Line 5 off their reservation, Enbridge has some major issues to deal with. But th this is an issue that's going on all over uh, Florida, Maine, Canada right now uh, has a big issue with the, the Kinder Morgan line in British Columbia and Trudeau has pledged that it's going to go through. And so what we see is about seven or eight states have already passed laws saying it's going to be against the law to protest. Uh, there are, they're, they're giving rights for drivers to drive over protesters in the roads to, to protect uh, people's uh, ability uh, to keep the traffic flowing. You're going to see a lot of action in Duluth in the next couple months. There's been some trials and tie downs up there. So there's a lot of activity, but it'll be mainly around Line 3 uh, and spearheaded by Winona LaDuke. 
You want to remember Winona LaDuke's father said one time when Winona was talking about tribal sovereignty, Winona LaDuke's father said, Winona, I don't want you to talk about tribal sovereignty until you learn how to grow corn. There's a relationship between growing your own food and your medicines and taking it. So this has all to be done in a holistic way. If we're going to reduce our fossil fuel imprint, we need to stay out of Walmart. We need to learn how to regrow our food in area. With Dane County here had a couple of the, some of the most wonderful rice, wild rice beds at one point in these areas. There isn't any wild rice at all in this area. And so we want to think, you know, re-envision where we're going when we reintroduce prairies to lands and other things because of the, the natural diversity is what sustained us at one particular point. Everyone was fed within a 60 mile radius of what, whatever was going on here in uh, this area. So, helpful? Thank you. Um, it makes me think, you know, like when you're under siege, it's hard to think about collaborative problem solving because you're um, yet, 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 that's the time when you most need your partners. So let me take this question here. Actually, I'm going to comment for a long time and then comment for Brad. Um, Wisconsin just passed a law in March making it illegal to protest um, against the businesses that are doing um, business in the settlements in the West Bank. And I don't think most people realize that. But it's something that we're going to have to, hopefully, with the new administration next year, get reversed. Yeah. That's happening state by state. Yeah. And then with Greg Armstrong, I remember we're members of Sunday Assembly, and the one of the things that you were most excited about the, the new monastery building was is the second most energy efficient in the state. I think it's the most LEED efficient um, building in the state. When, when it was evaluated for uh, uh, greenness by the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, it became the highest rated LEED certified building in the country. And, the, and then the, the, the award that Sister Mary David and Sister Joanne went to receive in Rio de Janeiro last year mm -hmm. for, from the international uh, ecological and uh, religious communities that they won an award for the Western Hemisphere. Yes, right, yeah, the Society for Conservation Biology had their international meetings in Colombia, and the sisters were invited down to receive the first Assisi Award for uh, religious-based uh, conservation. And let's, um, when you're answering questions, let's try to still use the microphone because it's, uh, it's a big room and there's voices coming in from the sides. Okay, I've got the next question I'm going to take, but let me just kind of see if I can get the next four or so lined up. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, do you remember your order? One, two, three, four, five. All right. One. Okay, yes, I will try to do that. So why don't you uh, stand and state, state your question, your name and your question. My name is Gina Paula. But I just kind of wanted to make a couple of plugs for Paul, the main library, I'm trying that they could speak on. Um, uh, Robin Wall, Kimmer is coming to Holy Wisdom on uh, the 16th of May. And her, she's going to come to speak. And also, a Women in Water Symposium up in the Court of Lane. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? So, thank you. All right, I think, the, I think the question will come out in the answers. So, uh, Greg, you want to? Uh, yes, we are very fortunate to have uh, Robin Wald Kimmerer. I don't know who she is. Uh, she's an uh, indigenous uh, woman who has written these fabulous uh, books, which are as important a statement about uh, the human relationship with the natural world as any that have ever been published, I think. Braiding sweetgrass. Just fabulous. Anyway, she's going to be at the monastery on May 16th. Okay, and I don't have the dates on the Women in Water uh, Symposium, but uh, by Mary Ellen B. Pardon me? 29th of July. 29th of July. I, I put it off, but uh, the thing is, is there's getting to be uh, almost too many activities to keep track of them all, which is really good because I know LAC, the FAMBO has. Uh, 
some uh, women water uh, walk activities as well. Mary Ellen Baker at the Couturier is putting on the Women in Water Symposium, which allows people to get together to talk about uh, the significance of, of, of clean water in your communities. The Great Lakes Intertribal Food Summit is meeting down in um, Tama, Iowa this year, which again it, it is a great place to learn about food systems, uh, soil conservation, uh, reinvigor reinvigorations of foods, medicines, and fuels uh, coming out of, of the forest, how to uh, work with uh, self-sustainability. Um, and, and, and all these people that are showing up at some of these symposiums like Tama, Iowa, or Zizak Foundation in, in Michigan from last year's, you'll see these people at a lot of these activities around the country about pipelines and mines and, and, uh, and other protests against environmentally degrading extractive industries. Great, thanks. You know, I just want to point out one thing before your next question. These cups are biodegradable, so mm -hmm. make sure that those of you who are using them get them into the compost bin, not the recycling or trash bin. I think so, is that right? Is that my understanding? That's what the program yeah. says. Mm -hmm. And that's what the little signs where you pick them up say, not up here, but back in the back, it says that. Um, yes? Uh, same question for Marcy. I'm Brian Holmes from Chicago. And I wanted to uh, maybe hear you uh, a little bit more about what forms of community and uh, citizen involvement it takes to sustain uh, a wild and scenic river. Okay, so the question is about um, what it takes from the citizen side of things to, to maintain. Um, so, citizens are involved throughout. Uh, we have an incredible <coughs> friends group um, that does both fundraising and volunteering. Um, the, the work of um, the actual people in the community um, is everything from our Earth Day litter cleanup this weekend to, um, to the prairie plantings and things like that. For the river itself, um, we maintain the uh, river as passable for canoers and kayakers. We do not remove log jams, we just keep it passable. Um, the canoe shuttle services um, do their part as far as litter cleanup as well. We would hope the relationship would continue to improve with them um, to, to keep uh, the policies consistent throughout the river. Um, if folks don't know, the Kickapoo River starts and ends in Wisconsin. It is one of the oldest dendritic river systems in the world. And so um, we are trying to work with the private businesses to uh, simple things like no glass on the river and, and where the, the litter goes and things like that. But otherwise, um, you know, Mother Nature is a pretty good job of taking care of things herself. So um, stream bank control, things like that. Uh, we are very aware of the invasive species issues. Um, and again, it's, it's a combination of volunteers, uh, we have a few employees that are, address it, and then the rest of it is just this network of everything from the Department of Natural Resources to the land conservancies and things like that. Thanks. Uh, I'm Lori Laz, I'm from here in Madison. And I was, uh, sure. We might need to get the question repeated after. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I was particularly uh, alert when Alandria said, I live in a place that is massively divided because I believe that uh, many of us here in Wisconsin feel like we live in a place that is massively <laughs> divided right now and, um, and nationally as well. And I feel like uh, so frequently it can, it can feel like such a barrier to action. And I'm, I guess what I'm inquiring about is what you see as either the uh, the links to some kind of umbrella mm -hmm. that we can all be involved yeah. with? So the question was around what it means for us to be massively divided and what are links to our umbrella that we can connect with. Before I say that, I want to encourage us to not use the word citizen unless we say global citizen, but instead to say community member, right? Because we're in a huge battle globally around citizenship and what it means and most of us are places we're not actually supposed to be. Um, and, and stole. And so uh, just for being a real conversation, because people think they're citizens in the U.S., and most of them aren't. They should well, go be somewhere else, maybe Europe. Um, but to just be honest, because I think the word citizen is really a, a, a difficult thing right now. So community members. 
I was in a city where one out of every seven people, it is literally not counting. It's really intense. Um, and so, links. <laughs> so, uh, I think one, so there's a couple things. I feel like one, music, food, community, children are links. Um, and so, so here's an example. So I live in a place where Trump signs are everywhere. Everywhere. They just are. It's okay. You know, we're in a, we're, we're whatever. Um, and so, like, I'm walking, I go around the corner, a guy I've known my entire life has a Trump sign in the yard. I look at him like he's crazy. He was like, ooh, and took the Trump sign. <laughs> oh, because it did not click in his brain, this means Elandria. What, what it, and so, same time, tornado hits, giant trees fall all over everywhere. Every neighbor has got their, like, they're in their pickup trucks, they've got the chainsaws, and they're all cutting up. Like, each, so me and Rachel, we're somewhere, right? And they're cutting up, and my dad calls, and it's like, everyone has come to help cut up the trees. It didn't matter whether you were black, white, Latino, no one gave, no one cared, Trump, whatever. that was irrelevant. What mattered is we need to cut down the tree. So the conversation we are having globally is it is time to get rid of parties on a local level. Parties only matter, maybe nationally. It's time to get back to community in a very different way. To be like, what do people actually need? How do we make that happen? And how do we see each other as family? And that means a radical transformation in how we look at each other. It means we have to say hi to each other when we walk on the street. It means we have to offer each other food, not in a way where you steal the food from me once I offer it, but actually be nice about it. Like there's some basics that we as a people don't have down and we're not thinking generationally forward or back, right? So what are, are we doing libations? Are we doing ancestral coming together? Are we spiritually filled and moving? And I'm not saying we all have to believe in the same spirit, but do we believe we're spiritually moving, even from an atheist perspective, so that I am not the center of all being, but that we are in a global sense of all being? And that is way more fundamental than, do we agree on whether or not to do this thing? Because where I live, it ended up being what the first time in what, 30 years that it didn't go Republican. Because we got down to like people and what, the, what we all needed, and people went, oh, hold on, that means not that. But it takes communication and like, hi, <laughs> right? And so, and so I want to just say it because I think we think it takes these really huge things, but it actually doesn't. It actually takes rebuilding community. And that we've lost. It's a logistical thing. I just, I'm, I'm Rachel from Beautiful Solutions. I just want to offer also um, that Alandria and I are here all week. And we're doing a series of events sponsored by the Haven Center at 4W. And tomorrow we're going to be doing a talk at the Haven Center at 4 p.m. at Helen C. White, 6191. And on Wednesday and Thursday we're going to be doing a couple of workshops um, that are about all of the ideas that Alandria has been talking about. Um, they're participatory popular education workshops um, all day on Wednesday at Art Inn um, at 1444 East Washington Ave. And then Thursday from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, on campus at Nancy Nicholas Hall, um, the plenary hall. Well, so just maybe people can capture you or you know, put it on social media or whatnot. Yes. Um, Earth Day hashtag, that would be happy great. To talk that would be about great. That. You know, as you were talking, though, as you talked about, you said, you know, kind of on local level, get rid of parties. And I, I've, I've been really struck by, I've now lived one year in Minnesota. I've been through one election cycle there. And um, in Minnesota, they have now for, at least for, local and state, um, I'm just not, maybe it's not statewide, maybe it's in the Twin Cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis, using uh, what they call ranked choice voting, some others call instant runoff voting. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what a difference that has made yep. in the way the campaigns work and the kind of dialogue that you get during a campaign. People are still in parties, but it's kind of irrelevant to the way the election works, and it's, it's really interesting. Um, who was, yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Sinclair from Madison, and my question was for Marcy, but it really builds off uh, what uh, Landria was saying, what others are saying. You, one of the things that you said, Marcy, was that the Kickapoo Valley Reserve uh, was evidence that bipartisan solutions really were possible. 
at least in the past. And uh, I, my question for you is, and I think I already know some of the answer based on what Alondria has said and others, um, how do you, uh, what, what pressures, have there been any pressures on you because of the polarization at the state and the national levels, or do you have such a, a, a well-defined, well-knit community focused on the Kikuku Valley Reserve that parties and politics, or at least national and state politics, don't really play an important role? Oh my God, how I wish it did. Yeah, okay, okay. So the, the question about the influence of, of national and state politics, um, I am a state employee. This is being recorded, so I will uh, <laughs> be very careful. So that's one of the influences, right? Is that state employees feel a, a very uh, strong pull to not be able to say everything we would love to. Um, but at the local level, um, it, there's still that conflict as well. Um, obviously, a couple years ago, the budget said that the Kickapoo Reserve was going to be transferred to the Department of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. The administration did not contact the Ho-Chunk Nation about that issue. They did not contact our board. We learned about it when the budget came out. So, so we have this this um, very local community members. Thank you for schooling me on that. The community members rose up united and said, "No, we finally got something that's working. Why would you make this?" And there's nothing wrong with the Department of Natural Resources. We work great with them, but that was not the format that we had with the Kickapoo Valley Reserve. So this on high saying this is going to happen you know, really brought, the, I mean, people that were always in favor of the dam came together and contacted the legislature. The Ho-Chunk Nation contacted the legislature. We had unanimous support in the Joint Finance Committee to leave it the way it was. And so, so things like that are still very polarizing. Um, we still get pressure for ATVs and off-road trucks to be out on a very sensitive soil. Um, so it, it, it's just that kind of constant, you know, vigilance to, and hopefully we've got the bases right that it's taken care of seven generations out. That came up a lot in negotiations that we have to think long term. We can't just solve one piece at a time. So, so yeah, that it, the pressure is there and we definitely feel it. Rural Wisconsin is, is definitely hurting. Um, and, and so I think I, we've just met, but I really liked a lot of what was said about, you know, getting rid of, rid of parties at the local level to solve problems. Very interesting. Thank you. And I had another person lined up for a question. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Marika. I'm with the Nelson Institute in Madison. Um, I'm interested to hear, because you've all been at the forefront of, I'm sure, very difficult conversations with the communities and city stakeholders and I'm very interested to hear and I know we have very short time maybe just a quick go around of what works in situations where you're really struggling to bring together a diverse set of stakeholders um, around an issue. Um, I think many people here may benefit or I do in the real place um, environmental conservation can benefit from this wisdom. So the, the question is, is how to bring a group of stakeholders together? A diverse set of stakeholders in difficult uh, conversations, which I'm sure you all and, and you might have, because the question that I, I, that's very similar actually to the question I was going to sort of launch with, which would be, so let me offer this up as another kind of angle on that. Have you ever, can you describe a time where uh, uh, you were, the, the group was really sort of at a precipice, and one was able to bring people together to uh, find um, something that would work for everybody. I'll go quickly first in the last uh, few minutes we have here. Uh, just a reminder that there are several copies of News from Any Country in the back by the water coolers. If people want to pick it up, there is information on some of these symposiums and workshops in there. But I, I think to your question is, is that, and, and what's been said is, is the conversation in the community has to take place. If, if, if political parties just argue with each other and throw things in the air, uh, nothing will happen, but you really have to sit down. When the Lacoudere tribe decided to oppose 
the uh, open pit mine up in the Pinocchies, they established a harvest education learning project or the help camp up there, which was open 24 7. People were invited to come up there. We had intoxicated gun, uh, uh, gun toting uh, Republicans who came into the camp angry because, you know, they were all for jobs, 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 and employment. Uh, versus what the tribal position was, but to get them to sit down, to have that cup of coffee, to have, to, to, to break bread with them. We got pictures of uh, uh, Iron County Board of Supervisors members walking out of a board meeting where there was arguments about whether there should be a, a more than a 14-day camping permit for the Lacoudere tribe in the Pinocchies eating fry bread because we handed yeah. out fry bread at the entrance. Wait, here it nice warm sugar copy, uh, uh, sugar coated <laughs> piece of fry bread and took pictures of them. That is, if, if you can get people to sit down at the table and if you can talk about children and grandchildren and what the future ought to be, you find you have the same kind of sentiments. You know, we want to stay in northern Wisconsin because it's beautiful, not because we want to build everything out of existence and force our children uh, out of the area because all the tamaracks have been cut down, which they have been in northern Wisconsin and all the tanning industries uh, uh, left. We should have been looking at this model of self-sustainability a long time ago. So that conversation at the table over the cup of coffee, over the meal, had to do with the future. And all of a sudden you begin to understand that there are more things in common with each other than they are different. The reason Chris Klein pulled out was he said, I didn't have a social, social contract with the community. It was obvious that there was opposition, and it might have been half and half, but by the time the conversation had taken play, place, we were at 65 70% of the community opposing that mine at that particular point, because we even says, why don't we just save the minerals for our grandchildren? If they're so valuable oh, now, yeah, yeah. how valuable will they be That's in the right. future, and maybe there's safer, safer ways to do it. And so coming together on some common denominators, Okay, okay, we got about 30 <laughs> seconds for each uh, person, so... Sorry. That's all right. Well, uh, I should say that the uh, sisters at Holy Wisdom Monastery have simplified their uh, kind of political issues in that they have uh, kind of uh, extricated themselves from the Roman Catholic Church. I don't think the bishop is terribly pleased about the whole situation. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, we have developed wonderful relationships. Um, I'd say, oh, I guess maybe it's my bias, but particularly with wonderful environmental organizations. Dane County Parks, the Prairie Enthusiasts, uh, the Audubon Society, uh, <coughs> you know, and it goes on and on. And they have been really important. Thanks. Marcy. I think uh, similar to what Paul said, one of, one of our pieces was when we uh, broke ground for the visitor center to be constructed and the elders from the Ho-Chunk Nation that went through the negotiation and the elders, the previous landowners that had been removed either through eminent domain or, or whatever, um, sat down together at the table and basically nudged each other and said, wow, we both really got the shaft, you know. And, <laughs> and it, was, it was one of those moments that, for one, you needed to celebrate, but you also needed to acknowledge mm -hmm. that there was a lot of pain in this community over and over again for hundreds of years. And so you had to come together and kind of bring that, that to a conclusion and then, and then move on. So that was one of ours. So I'll just say two things that you can look up yourself. One is an extreme extraction summit. Um, so we started 10 years ago gathering people working on all levels of extraction and nuclear to come together because people were saying fracking is worse than coal. Coal is worse than oil. <laughs> and we were like, are we serious? Um, and so we had to bring people together to actually hammer it out to go, actually, it's all bad. And we have to all collaboratively work together. The second is a program called App Fellows. So we started a fellowship program around how young people could stay home and we were with philanthropy, education, nonprofits, for profits, and government. Because we were like, if we're going to solve local challenges, we need all five groups to figure out how to work together. And that's what did it. The other last thing I'll say is I live where I'm from. And so this is my plug for people living where they're from. 
The reason why changes has happened so much where I live now and in my region is we have decided to not move, but stay. And so the people I talk to are people I've known since I was two. And they look at me and don't go, you're fighting me. They go, that's my girl. That's my baby. And so because the babies have stayed home, it's an entirely different conversation. Wow, that's great.